Welcome, everybody, to Let's Talk Computer Science, a podcast dedicated to talking about the past, present, and future of computer science. This podcast is made possible by our friends at Rex Academy. Be sure to check out their amazing CS platform, including courses on cybersecurity, app development, and the buzzword in education these days, AI. Don't have a teacher? Not a problem. Rex is now providing instructors as part of their platform, so be sure to check them out at rex.academy. And today, I'm excited to have on the show Becky Keene. She is the Director of Operations at I2E. Right, Becky? I2E? Yep, that's correct. I tweet. We've got, a lot, we've got a lot of acronyms in education, so educate us <laughs> particularly. What is I2E? What is the organization? What does it do? Uh, I2E stands for Insight to Execution, and we are an education consultancy company. We do professional development, content, curriculum, um, and consulting in ed, ed tech primarily, but of course, ed tech means we just do all the education things, So, because it all is related. Yeah. Yeah, it seems like ed tech over the years has gone from a one-off thing. Of course, we had a pandemic that probably assisted with that in some ways. And now it's like embedded in everything, which is good. So I imagine you're not you're not uh, short of work to do at some days when it comes to educational consulting. Um, no, no, it's great. Give me a little bit about your origin story too. I want to hear like what did what brought you to where you are today? Is there a light bulb moment or something in your career? And since this podcast is around computer science, maybe there's something tech. Maybe it was something you did in, as a student or as an educator early on. Tell me a little bit about your background and then kind of what was that light bulb moment for you? Ooh, okay. So I, uh, I have always been a techie sort of human. Um, I, you know, did. DOS programming and Lemonade Stand Ooh. and all that. Oh um, yes, that's Lemonade cool. Stand was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> back in the back in the eighties, um, yep. Played you know Parsec on my home TI. Um, oh whatever. boy, now you're really showing your geek card. I love it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's good stuff. Um, I've always always been into that. Fascinated by coding, by the idea of games and education, the idea of allowing kids to empower their own voice through technology. Um, fast forward to the year 2000, I was student teaching at the time and I t student taught with an amazing mentor who kind of gave me my lead, if you will, right? Did a ton of, I was very well prepared for my own classroom. She was amazing to work for, but she let me do some things that she had never done before. And that was really, really exciting. So we published a class newsletter with Microsoft Publisher. And, yes. you know, the kids were doing, you know, typing up their stuff. She'd never had them type their stories before and illustrate them and scan it in and put it in a newsletter for parents. It just hadn't been done. So things like that were just exciting to me naturally. And when I got hired for Kent School District here in the Seattle area, I was immediately drawn to the technology innovation side of teaching. And I said yes to everything. Uh, like, yes, I want to interact with whiteboard in my classroom. Yes, I want my kids to all have handheld computing devices. My fourth graders, yes, yes, yes. And so I started doing one-to-one -one in 2003 um, wow. with kids taking devices home. That's yeah. Very um, early. 2003 is like, that's like almost a decade prior to when I started. So what was that like? It's a lot of learning <laughs> things like I wanted my kids to take home books off ebooks, you know, and, and licensing and DRM and what does that mean? And really kind of pushing the envelope, um, a little bit with lots of great support from my school district. And that was a lot of fun. And so really seeing the, the power that that does, the engagement that students had, the excitement they had, I have some great, great stories that I won't go into. You have to reach out to me elsewhere um, about working with kids who who don't have things at home. Um, right. My school district was 140 languages spoken, high need. A lot of kids who don't have things at home that they can do, um, use for homework, maybe no internet. And so in the you know early 2000s, that, those are the kids that I was working with. And so to give them devices, say, I trust you, you will take care of this. You will bring it back. You will, you know, not get um, not get it taken from you on the walk to school. And if you do, just let it go. All those conversations had to be had, and so that just kind of shifted my whole career trajectory into a place where I I saw the power to bridge gaps, to engage kids, to build excitement and learning. And so that's something that I've stuck with. And my career really has been. Um, if I was to, were to give it a picture, it would be ripples in a pond. So I, you know, started influencing my classroom 
And then I was asked to influence my school district. And then I was asked to present at conferences and go share what we were doing. Because as you pointed out, people weren't doing it then. Um, broadly, certainly not broadly. Um, I was learning yeah. from other teachers who were ahead of me as well. So um, just scaling that out. And now I get to work with schools around the world, which is an incredible honor and the opportunity to just, you know, impact more kids ultimately. Well, I think it goes a lot. It says a lot about your own mindset when you're like, yes, let's take it on. Yes, I'll try that new thing. Yes. <laughs> and I think that's a that's a thing that I, I mean, you work with teachers all the time, too, when it comes to integration of technology, <laughs> as do I. And it's not innate or inherent in every single teacher. I mean, there's a, a group of teachers that we'll run across, and I'm sure you've done these two, run into these teachers too, where they're they're reticent or hesitant to try maybe something that's new or different when it comes to integration of technology. What are your you work with them a lot? What are some techniques you've used? Yeah, what are some techniques you use to kind of like say, hey, this isn't so bad after all? I mean, it's one thing to tell them, but I mean, getting them mm -hmm. on board with it. How how do you do that? So instructional coaching is the number one model for uh, making impact on schools all up, right? And that's one of the things we just launched. There's a plug um, at I2E is a certified coach program. And awesome. We Yes, so exciting. Um, we're the first in the world to offer the Microsoft certified coach credential. And it's starting this summer. But that comes from um, me and our CEO both have a background in instructional coaching and knowing that when I walk into a classroom and have a teacher look at me and say, which has happened, help me understand how to shut down everything on these laptops. I want them yeah. under the desks. I don't want kids touching them, right? That's not what we're doing here in my classroom. And, and you have to, as an instructional coach, you have to be okay with that. You have to be able to say, okay, let me help you wherever you are right now. And right. know that that relationship building of trust and helping that teacher understand that, that they have reasons for the dynamic that they've established in their classroom and helping them see the things that technology could help that are true problem solvers for that teacher. We don't want to create more problems, yeah. <laughs> create more challenges. We want to give them things that truly make it better. Um, and then to be able to walk alongside that teacher and see long-term um, growth in innovation is something that is, it's not a short-term game. It's something that you really have to be in it for. And so that teacher in particular who, you know, looked at me and said, help me shut all these down was someone who eventually over time, over the course of an entire year, had worked with me on giving some digital assessments with instant feedback for his students. And that was a game changer for everyone involved. But it didn't start by me saying, oh, no, no, don't do that. It started right. with me saying, sure, let me show you. And let me ask you why. And, and let's have a conversation. Let's talk about it. And can I come back? Um, so. That's very design, very design thinking of you to start with empathy, by the way. That's the way to do it, right? I think I, I think you and I had the same teacher, by the way, because my the teacher I had, same thing. He's like, how can I sit at my desk and like see everything they're doing and I want to shut everything down? And right. it's funny because formative assessment was the tool that I used to get the instant feedback you were just mentioning. That was the tool that I got him over the hump. He's like, okay. This isn't as bad as I thought, right? <laughs> Some of those things yeah. are like the, we call it the the gateway drug, if you will. And sure, that's maybe yeah. Appropriate, but, you know, something that like gets you in the door. It hooks you, yeah. And yeah. there's nothing wrong with that. I do think it's interesting too, because, you, you know, one of the things I love that, by the way, instructional coaching, that's, a, that's an important part. And I love that you guys have launched that program because that's something that is going to sustain no matter what changes come in technology. It's that same kind of mantra and belief of like, let's look at a tool, let's assess it and see like how useful is it for learning. And then let's either put it forward or maybe we put it aside for now. One tool in particular that's coming to mind now is a big one that is on everyone's mind is, you know, AI. I, and I'm not mm -hmm. going to say AI in general because AI, you know, falls into many buckets. And I think we don't realize, right. a lot of people don't realize it's been out for, we've had AI for a long time. Um, right. But generative AI, generative AI like ChatGPT and, and the art programs that you see like Canva's, you know, uh, they got their text to image creator now, um, mm -hmm. those kind of tools, uh, you know, there's a little bit of a fear factor there again, that we're having teachers overcome, yep. which goes back to your instructional coaching model. So what are, what's your take? First of all, what's your 10,000 foot view on AI in general, like the generative AI that's coming out. And then second question to that would be like, how do you, if you do think it's a good thing, how do you encourage teachers to kind of ride alongside it? So I approach new things, I hope mostly with curiosity. And so 
you know, we, yes, we've known AI is there. It's been embedded in many of the core tools we use on our smartphones, our mapping software. Our, I mean, it's been running our lives for longer than people realize, right? But this one is now just this new hot button. And, and, and I like to view it as, let's see what kids can do with this tool. Now, ChatGPT in particular has some age requirements. So I'm, I'm going to yes. just set that aside for now and say, you know, let's say you're complying with Sipacopa Furpa everything and then you're using it with students, however old they are. Um, I do think there's a ton of power there. And it's, it's part of our job as teachers to be curious and figure out where those powerful um, learning lessons and experiences come into play. It's also, I think, incredibly important for us to realize the shift. And when this first came out, I'm not the only one who has said this for sure. But for me, it was a light bulb moment to say, wait, this, this is our generation's calculator. And, yeah. and I've always been a big fan of calculators, even though I'm like pretty decent at math. <laughs> I'm the same here. Right, yeah. nice jump around. And so I'm one that would say to my own children and my students, Hey, you know, check that with photo math, check that with Wolfram Alpha, like go, go scan it and see, go use the OneNote math tools. So I've been doing that all along. That's more my personal approach. And so for me to say to a student, Hey, have chat GTP write this, the conclusion paragraph for this essay you just wrote, because I see you're struggling, you know, give it three or four tries, app, smash them together, see what works best for you, add your personal voice, edit it and turn it in. Like, I think that's amazing critical thinking and it, it removes some of the barriers for students who are not natural authors. Right. Um, and when this all kind of, you know, first became really, really mainstream a couple months ago, like blew up my daughter, who's 12, we were talking about it at dinner and she said, well, what is the more important job, the author or the editor? And I tweeted mm. that out and it got a lot of really great comments because I, I, there's no answer there, but it's meant to be a think about, which is how she meant it. And it's a really great question. So I think giving kids that access is critical. We were one of the first school systems in the country to unblock YouTube um, a very, very, very long time ago. Um, and that conversation came from, okay, they're using it anyway. They're not using it well or safely. And if we don't talk to kids about how to use it powerfully, we are now doing them a disservice as citizens. So uh, all that to say, I think it definitely has its place. It's exciting and we should be actively involved with shaping the data that it's getting because AI at its core is based on someone's code and yeah, we want to make bias. sure, right. Yeah. We want to make sure that that code is going in the direction that we believe it should be as a society. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what our kid, my daughter was using, um, her daughter, the teacher, she was, she designed some, or she did a lesson where she did a prompt with the kids mm -hmm. and had them all look at it. And then they edited it and changed it and, and, and improved it. And um, she came home and didn't know what it was called. I knew it was Chat GPT, but she was like, "Oh, it's some sort of tool, and you can plug something in, and it spits out a story." And um, mm -hmm. but she was talking about you know prompts and like using some of the terminology. I was like, "That's." I wonder right. in the next ten years, like, what will our kids? Are they going to be like? We're all like, "Wow, this is crazy!" You know, the world's going to you know everything's going to change, or you know, Terminator or whatever. It's, you know, we go to every yeah. extreme we can think of as adults, but for kids, do you, I mean, are they going to look back and go, "Yeah, that's just another tool I use," right? Yep. Yeah, I, I would guess. And one of the things I like, so Bing released its own version. It's in total beta. Yeah. But one of the things I think it does really well is when you type in a query, you know, and ask it something, right? And, and now we're talking about query engines and, you know, editing yes. those and what does it mean to create a prompt and prompt engineering. Um, Bing will show you on screen which search which searches it's performing in the background to get you the information that um, that it's you know spitting back out in a very generative way, and I think that is incredibly powerful because it gives students that connection of like I'm asking a tool to do these these four or five different searches on my behalf and combine the information together, and that really it's just creating a shortcut where that information is living on the internet. And making connecting those dots for students, I think, is incredibly important because how often have we asked a student where they got a piece of information and they say, sure. "Oh, it's on Google." I'm like, no, it wasn't <laughs> Google on is my Google. source, <laughs> right? Like, you used a search engine called Google and it got you this website. 
And so again, helping them connect like this, this text is coming from cumulative knowledge elsewhere. Um, and that's, that's another really important piece. So I like that the Bing engine surfaces that for students. I do like that too. And I've seen some early work around that. Um, you, you strike me as a person who, who goes out and, and is excited about new things and tries new things, but also not, not afraid to like, again, like if it works great, if it's good for education and learning, great. Where do you go? Like, where's your, where's your go-to for when you're like, okay, I, I'm looking for new things. Is it are you reading books? Is it online? Is it social media? Where do you, where do you get all your like collective knowledge from yourself? Or are you just plugging it into chat GPT to tell you? <laughs> right. Like just putting yeah. inquiries. What should yeah. I try today? What should I learn today? I like, <laughs> you, you could probably do that. Um, and now I'm curious about it. Now I'm going to totally type that in after this is over. <laughs> yeah, let's go. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, Twitter. Twitter is a big one for me. I'm yeah. on, um, on Twitter a lot and there's just such a great, I, you know, not getting into new CEOs and whatever. I've continued <laughs> to see Twitter as a place where I can gain information in a way that helps me grow um, consistently for the past, um, I don't know, I've been on it for like 12 years. I think I just had my Twitter anniversary and, you know, it tells you to share it. Yay. Um, yeah. Yeah. So t- Twitter, absolutely. That's kind of where I get most of my information as a jump off point. Right. And then, and then I'm able to reach out from there. Um, people send me things. I have like, enough followers now where people send me stuff to try out, which I love, um, helps me feel fresh and current and interested in what's coming out and what's going out next. And I can throw that on a blog or a newsletter or something, or just share it myself. So that's one of the places that I go. Yeah. I lo- and I think that's where we've connected, uh, although we've never met in person, uh, but there's True. a few times we've had opportunities, but one of these days, our paths will cross the IRL as the kids say these days. Um, yeah. Tell me or tell our audience, I guess, where are some where can we find out more about you and your great work? Where where are you posting all your stuff? On Twitter, give me your Twitter handle and then also is there other places where you're posting information? Well, the good news is if you just do a web search for my name, Becky Keen, and you spell it with all the E's, um, I'll come <laughs> up. So my website, um, I'm active on Twitter. Um, I post to Facebook, you know, Instagram, LinkedIn regularly. Um, with all the different lenses that that means, right? So like Instagram is like, yay, my travels. Um, LinkedIn is more articles. Um, Twitter is definitely the most active one. Um, So you can find me there. I have a book about the seven C's of education that has gotten great feedback and has helped some teachers, which is an amazing honor. Again, help teachers around the world to see things in new ways. So that has been fun to connect um, with people that way as well. Well, we'll uh, we'll plug all these in the show notes, folks. So those of you who are listening out there, we'll make sure we get a link to Becky's book in there. And uh, I want I encourage you guys to check out a lot of she, Becky. There was a we didn't get into this, but I mean, she posted something about a teachermatic, which is a AI tool for teaching. I mean, there's all mm-hmm. sorts of stuff. She is a fountain of knowledge and a connector in many ways too. So Becky, thank you for being a part of the show. Thanks for inviting me, Carl. It's been great. And thank you all for being a part of Let's Talk Computer Science. And again, thanks to our friends at Rex Academy for making this podcast possible. Be sure to check out their platform at rex.academy. We all know technology will be a part of all of our future. And as educators and leaders, it's our role to make sure that all, and I mean all students, have an opportunity to that future as well. This is Carl Hooker, signing off.